we are live. Hello. Yay. Welcome Hello. back. <laughs> uh, I'm Christina, for anyone that hasn't been following along, and I've got my lovely friend Barbie Long here with us today, and we're trying to figure out how we even met and got to know each other as friends and coworkers in this, but there's just so many exciting things that we've done since whenever that was. <laughs> and I just, oh, I, yeah, oh. actually, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, today, Facebook reminded me of um, when we worked the, the Lyft Pride Parade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. March, oh. sorry. No, Even as of two years ago, we were aware of it. Like, you know, Pride yeah. likes to be call, have it be called a march, which it is. But, um, yeah, but it was just very different, just remembering that day. And the yeah. Float. It's a, a different world a couple years ago yeah. when you could be in a crowded space and think other things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but Barbie, I would love to ask you, because I'm not sure if I've even asked you this in private before, uh, how did you get into the film business and maybe what was your first uh, job with cameras? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always revising the answer, I think. But um, I think ultimately it is indecision in college about what to pick as a, as a major. Picking film um, being, as I mentioned, I went to a college in Rochester, um, being that there was no film production course, I ended up doing a film theory uh, degree there. Um, so even though there's no hands on, you know, um, you know, shooting at that point, you know, it just kind of laid a background. And then just by nature of being from New York and just moving back um, after college, it was sort of like, you know, do I uh, go on Craigslist and find a PA job? And, you know, I did. And then, you know, just like kind of after a, a while of being underemployed in the production department, like, you know, PAing and, and ADing a couple of times, it was just like that classic thing of realizing, oh, um, the, you know, the, the action is over there, clustered by camera. So I want to go to there. And um, I actually, the first PA job I got was actually on a, um, a, a, a very micro budget feature. Um, where I went into the resume of like, hey, I've never PA'd before. May I PA for you for no money? And it was like, well, we need a script supervisor. And then it was like pre-internet searching. So I actually went to the Manhattan Library to the reference section where you're not allowed to check books out because they're so rare and like just photocopying and like reading books on how to be a script supervisor and like That's amazing. how <laughs> production works. And like how to do like a line script or whatever. And then so suddenly I was a, the script supervisor on this 28 day shoot, you know, doing all the classic things of like running around Brooklyn and like that. Yeah. So I still vividly remember that. And the film never came out, of course. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, to finish your answer. So yes, like after that, like, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, just, um, and this was like, right when people stopped shooting film like there were still a couple of projects but it was mostly digital and um just like ACing and feeling underemployed and all that stuff and then at some point I hit a wall moved to San Francisco clarified everything um and then moved back to New York and that and then that's when I started like operating in, in DP and you know phasing everything else else out yeah that's awesome um do you want to maybe explain more about to people that don't know you about your experience with AFI and Cinematographers XX? Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it picks up right where we left out, where I came back, and so um, sort of you know rebranding, you know, as an, a camera operator and um, a DP. Um, at that point, at, at that point, um, I was um, you know just trying to you know, enlarging the network, you know, now that I'm, you know, I can only say no to ACing so much, like you kind of need some new contacts. And I remember um, I was, uh, I, I went to stalk Leah Mayerhoff, um, who's an NYU MFA grad, um, who had a feature coming out at the time. And I had almost worked on her film, um, but I, I never got to meet her. So I went to meet her. And literally, as I was, you know, doing that awkward thing of like, you know, after Q&A, like you're waiting to like meet somebody. Um, I started talking to somebody else and they were asking me, oh, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a cinematographer. And like literally Leah swiveled her body. And it's like, you're a cinematographer. Hi, I'm Leah. And so my point in that is that she was keeping a list because like she had um, started film fatales. 
And so she was keeping a list um, of um, cinematographers because um, they were thinking of doing a branch, you know, branching off like a film fatale um, DP list that never quite happened. But what happened is that cinematographers XX was starting up like kind of right at that point. And so they were sourcing lists of like asking Leah, so, oh, who do you know? And then she's like, here's this list. And that's like literally how I got into CXX, like from the ground floor, because wow. I was, you know, I was on this other list for this thing that didn't exist. And then this thing was about to exist. And then, and then suddenly I was like at a bar and like just talking to all of these New York DPs um, who identify as women. And we were just, you know, talking and like definitely um, a more junior member in that group. Um, and, you know, just everybody that I, that I met from that first meeting, I probably, you know, where, you know, our relationship has deepened since then. And, uh, you know, on Zoom calls with them, you know, like every week now. Um, so, so that's that. And, um, and the AFI um, is, you know, since they launched it, um, so that this would have been the third year. So obviously they can't do it this year because it's in, it was in the summer, I think, um, late summer, something like that. So they started three years ago and when they launched it, it was very much billed as, oh, this is like for, um, uh, like an introduction, you know, and then okay. um, sort of just in our community, there was a lot of uproar. It's like, well, isn't, there's no lack of women who are starting out, you know, in camera or or um, DPs. It's like people who are kind of closer to the middle who are like that that need a program like this. So the second year is when I, uh, I so I didn't even apply that first year because I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is not appropriate for me. I would be like taking in somebody's spot, blah, blah, blah. And so the second year I applied, um, and got in and um, basically it was um, a long weekend in LA. Um, so I flew over there and it's, um, it's free. Um, and again, met, um, I think and it ended up being a group of uh, tw 12 or 15, something like that. So it's a very small group and it was um, sort of, you know, not a hard sell, but it gave you a taste of what AFI would have been just sort of like, well, this is one, one class that you would be taking and how mm. that fits into um, how we see an AFI, a cinematographer, you know, um, like this is how we kind of shape an AFI cinematographer. And, um, you know, I, I really thought that getting it was, um, would have been what I got out of it most, to be honest, um, because I think that people were very con congratulatory, um, you know, when I sort of posted social media or told other people about it. Um, so I wasn't expecting too much. But again, when I went there, you know, I met um, a lot of people who work out of LA. So it's sort of suddenly I have an LA network, which was really amazing. Um, and I think that there were some um, really touching moments during that weekend and some real pushes of, um, of supporting people's careers as in, um, you know, there were a couple of people like, you know, from on the sponsorship level that I had subsequently asked for specific substantive things for projects of like, oh, can you connect me to, you know, your so-and-so in New York, you know, and that has happened and that it has led to very real things you know, in terms of like, you know, getting um, equipment packages for small um, narrative projects or, you know, things like that. So, I mean, a lot of real things came out of it, That's you know, awesome. for me at least. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like uh, that, that side of the story is, it's kind of hard to explain sometimes for people or hard to like list in a, like a history, right? Like when was this time that you felt really supported and it took you to there, you know, like you can have all these really nice moments, but sometimes it's hard to like pick them out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was just curious if there was any, were there are certain people at AFI or just along your career in general that really helped kind of like nudge you to where you are now? Um, I think, I mean, obviously it's not the same question as when people ask like oh do you have a mentor and like I definitely never had a mentor but like yeah I mean there are a lot of sort of defining moments where um it's one example it's it's a DP that um I don't really have that much contact with anymore but um when I because I, I also did some um I called it a G&E vacation when I uh, moved back from San Francisco, you know, just because I wasn't AC before. And when I moved back, like I felt like I needed um, more G&E 
um, knowledge. So I took a, a couple months. And so I, I worked on this one DP's project and, um, and it was more of, of what she said at the end of it to me. Um, like on the last day, she kind of said like, like, I think you're going to be fine. Like, you know, of, because at that point I hadn't even, um, I shot, I think one project, like, you know, that, that I was proud of as a DP, but you know, um, so just, just things like that. Like, I really remember that very brief conversation where it's like, yeah. I think you're going to be fine, you know, and that, and that's something that you can carry with you. Um, I think, and then more concretely, um, like maybe even like projects. I feel like sometimes that's it. It's oh, not yeah, the one yeah, yeah, person, yeah. but like, do you think there was one project yeah. that really shaped where you are now or has got to you to <sighs> excited about the next, whatever the next is? I feel like every project is, is that, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, uh, the only thing is like, I would separate some that maybe were, maybe that were more meaningful. I think uh, a project that I shot in, in San Francisco um was the first one that really played niche festivals it was um a short film called be right back and it just like feels so old now um but it some like when i have seen it again in some ways i feel like have i gotten any better than that like i don't i don't know like <laughs> maybe it's the same stuff but like that was definitely a big moment because um it was it was like that feeling where you're surprised by what you were able to do I guess. Um, and it was like the first one that, that played at um, festival, played a lot of um, queer festivals, like Frameline, got into Frameline, like kind of made the film for Frameline in a sense, mm. you know, to play at Frameline and it did. And then it, it, it also had a very long life. Um, so that was great. And then when I got back, um, I think a similar one here, I shot Dysphoria, which I really liked because I think it was, I don't know, it was like the first time I worked with Ari um, here, but like, definitely at least might have been yeah it might have been the first one but I would say like Aerie um in here in New York yes everyone at Aerie <laughs> I think has been the most supportive yeah um yeah so um yeah I think Ryan's work we're naming names um Cecilia Chen they I mean literally I I was um what was it it was when it was when uh Panasonic was coming out um with uh with their camera with the very cam and Eva line and they were doing a presentation there and I could drag myself out um out there um because there was like four ASC members you know who were loving the camera at the time and I'm like oh I should go and then I was you know, it was one of those days where um you know I didn't really want to socialize but it's like before the presentation people were like just mingling so like I grabbed some cheese and then I just like go sit like you know in the audience you know and like literally um Cecilia and Ryan came up to me specifically to talk to me and they have and it's like oh you know just call us you know, when, when you, when you, um, if you want to come back and like, you know, um, take a tour or play with stuff and that has not stopped. Like that has just been consistent, you know, and, and that was definitely a, a first moment where I'm like, where it felt like, um, surprising and, but also very genuine and, um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of why I'm in it too. You know, there's these really amazing moments where, you, I think surprise is really a good word for it. <laughs> you know, you're always like surprised that people are as generous and as decent as they are because it can be like how many times you can't count when it's really competitive or when it's yeah. a little rough out there. <laughs> so when, when someone's just like really nice, that just somehow makes a really big difference. Um, but to go specifically more or less here, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about your visual aesthetic as a DP and do you feel that like someone that maybe is trying to hire you perceives it in a certain way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think perception is a is a good way to ask that question. Um, I think I think currently people perceive my aesthetic as very colorful. Um, you know, uh, maybe um, yeah, just sort of like a maybe a bit of a kinetic energy or very colorful. Um, so that, and I don't, I don't know if I like that or not, um, because there's definitely some, um, like peers work specifically, and then also some established, um, cinematographers work that is very much 
in a way it's like very in vogue, right? Like, you know, just sort of very um, desaturated, you know, um, maybe high contrast or, you know, um, or, or in another way, like washed out blacks, you know, things like that. And um, in some ways, I mean, it, sometimes it's, it's about the specific projects that come up and um, I, you know, can't just randomly explore that aesthetic just just because I want to, right? Um, but like, it's like to an extent, like, I don't even know if I can do that. I think that I can, you know, some of these things like, um, you know, very, uh, very like, um, maybe like Ozarky, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that kind of aesthetic, it is very much in vogue at the moment. It's like, I don't even know if I can, can do that. If I'd like to think that I can, but I can't explore it if people perceive my aesthetic in a certain very colorful mm. way you know um yeah. so because those would be the projects that I would be approached with and then so I keep shooting those and then that continues to be perceived as, as my aesthetic um but so I have to sort of make conscious efforts to like pivot you know each project you know both into what it sh you know should be appropriate for the script but also um to, to try something else you know to and then I, so oh, I feel like also the pivot is very slow because I still need to give them the color that they or whatever it is you know needs to give them what they they want from me whilst trying to um, build in something a little bit new and then so like slowly with each project you know hopefully we can explore everything you know totally well that's part of the what the collaboration of this and I think you know I, at one point I was trying to kind of look at cinematography as if you could just look at a movie and just focus on the camera, you know, it's like, I just want to look over here. And sometimes that can be a fun experiment, but really the camera team is as much a part of the collaboration with the director and the set designers and the costume, you know, like everything. So um, it just makes me curious because I feel like it doesn't exist on its own, you know, and as much as you, maybe in this like dream bubble cinematographers could just be like off in their world making their own images but the reason why they sometimes excel and speak louder than say like a still photographer is because of some narrative or someone's which is a long way about for me to say um would you mind telling me a bit more about your uh, personal history with collaborating with directors specifically and how uh what's the word i'm looking for how maybe you can share with them your insight about color and composition mm -hmm. versus just kind of giving them what they want. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just by nature of working on a lot of independent um, shorts in New York, um, I end up working with a lot of first time and sometimes second time directors, but usually if it's a second time director, they're looking for a much more polished aesthetic than you know their freshman film which yeah. you know um so overall overall there is a lot of room for me like in the projects that i've ended up taking to sort of um impose you know my own thoughts on it um and it's it's only it, it's it was it's quite infrequent or very specific uh, do I get pushback on it, you know, like mm -hmm. overall, um, there's been a lot of projects where I have been able to really build it. It's just at the same time, like, I feel like I'm building it from the ground up, but also when you look back on it, oh, it, it is exactly like our lookbook that we, you know, agreed yeah. on together, you know, and that's all, also sort of the magic, right? When it's, I, cause I love reviewing lookbooks you know, at different stages in post and even like years after the film came out, I just like, I just want to check how accurate the lookbook I'm making today for the project that I'm making. Like, you know, so like, I like to refine that process so that it really does feel like the lookbook because that makes me like, feel like the, the new film that I'm making now will end up looking the way that we mm -hmm. think. But anyway, so like, um, yeah, so like, I, I think I mentioned um, Dysphoria as one film where, um, the director was a visual artist primarily. Um, so she didn't even come from film. So like that gave a lot of leeway because, you know, it, it's like, she is not like always thinking about how to cover things or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, but the, the overall aesthetic is definitely hers, you know, in, uh, in terms of the color and everything. But, um, there was a lot of flexibility in terms of like what units to bring in or like, you know, even what, 
even what like color temperature certain scenes are like if it because mm. it wasn't really dictated by things like it, specifically I'm thinking like it was one scene um, outside um, in in uh, at a swimming pool an outdoor swimming pool and you know just like you know and it ended up being like one unit really far away that was very um, was very uh, bright very punchy and that's sort of all we all we used for it and I really like the way that ended up but um, yeah, but it felt very hands off from the directors, from you know, from my point of view. Um, and then even when times where like I felt like there was more, um, with more uh, sort of pressure coming from you know either uh, creative producers or directors, um, it was more like some directors are just so specific about what they want, but at the same time, it's not very specific. Like it's like I you know you know I, you know, I have yeah. to like make a I have to make a lot of decisions to um, satisfy what they're looking for, but they there are actually no specifics in what they're asking for. <laughs> um, so that was really challenging, and that kind of applied to the, actually the last narrative project that I shot yeah. this year. Yeah, before going into this vacation, um, that one. But it was it was it was really good, you know. And I think we we rose the challenge of it, you know. And and we're going into color for that one though, so that's Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, this afternoon Ooh. I have a, a, a call. We're gonna start coloring it at um, uh, Nice Shoes, which is also um, another group of people who have been very supportive. So my first time working with them, so I'm excited about that too. That's awesome. Well, I was wondering actually if you could maybe explain a bit more about your lookbooks. Uh, and I was curious because I've been thinking a lot about how uh, this interplay between how we as creative people stay inspired when we're normally running around and doing stuff all the time and staying inspired now that we're in COVID. So I was just curious if maybe you can explain a bit more about how you stay inspired and how you bring that to directors for like visual reference. Yeah, um, staying inspired. Yeah, I think like a lot of DPs, you know, love to talk about specific photographers and all that stuff. And I don't, I don't know that I really do that justice, you know, even though I do love um, still photography and I did have a hot moment where I did take a lot of still photography when it was like 35 millimeter stuff. Um, I'm not, you know, like, I'm not really like a name droppy kind of person. Like I like to just see images like when I see them, it could be like, it could be commercial photography. And like, if I just like, like it, I'll just save it, you know, and put it in my Google um, album. Um, I like, I like a lot of, I like to look at a lot of the work people do in non prestige spaces, you know, okay. like I love television and I've always loved television, you know, um, in fact, like when I was in college, um, like it, 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 I took some course and actually, I mean, it was like also the professor influencing me, but you know, I took television courses, you know, at a point where we, you know, we were looking at like eighties television, nineties television and like, um, you know, it, so it's not like about like, Oh, a beauty aspect of things, but like, so anyway, so to this day, like I still like watching television, which has other ther therapeutic, personal, um, you know, uh, reasons that I'm watching it. I just, I just want to watch this TV show, but I feel like I get a lot of ideas from that, you know, mm. because especially since like, we're all working, like, you know, somebody who is very talented is in fact shooting this. It's just that they might not be shooting the most prestigious thing, but like, you know, sometimes you just get flashes of like, that's kind of brilliant or like, um, it, or like, um, like just un unexpected, like maybe they got away f with something, you know, like mm. they like really fought hard for something and they got it in the edit and it's yeah. like, you know, and, and I think that kind of stuff can be really cool. Or like, at least that's what I'm thinking about recently. Um, are there I'm, certain I'm watching stuff? Are there certain TV shows that have like really inspired you specifically now during COVID? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would go that far. Um, there's been some shows that I've watched because, you know, DPs that I know have been working on it. So it's a yeah. more of a specific watch. Sure. Um, so I don't know if I, have, if I have a good answer for that. I mean, there's certainly like a lot of shows that I have been watching that like I, I like. Um, I mean, I know everybody's watching, like watching Watchmen right now because it's out, but like I watched it when it came out and like there's, 
there's a lot of, you know, things I like about that. Um, overall, I would say, like, sort of throughout my lifetime, I'm just, like, a really big fan of sci-fi. So okay. it's, like, all all iterations of that, really, you know, from, you know, like, 90s, Star Trek, The Next Generation, which actually I, there are some episodes where I do go back and look at the way that I was directed. And, yeah. you know, because there are some structures in science fiction that kind of yeah. force you to make interesting choices, you know, like time travel is a big one, you know, and that, and that's not limited to like traditional sci-fi. Like that's, it's like, um, you know, like new Star Trek has a lot of um, time traveling, um, you know, obviously like, like Watchmen is like a, a combination of almost like tunneling and flashback. You know, I think like all those things are kind of related. And so looking at the way that people shoot those, you know, when you're, you're repeating things, when you're on a loop and how you might choose to cover that or light that um, when you're coming back to the same moment, you know, I really like those, you know, watching it for, oh, you're repeating the scene again, but here are the things that are different about it, either like color or, you know, shot size, the angle, whatever. And like what those things can mean because I'm such a big sci-fi fan that like, you know, they're my favorite human stories. Um, so, yeah. Would you say there are certain uh, DPs of sci-fi projects that then you've then followed like, oh, they did this. Now I want to see them in another thing or is it more just that genre? I think like, no. Yeah, it's not DP specific because like, you know, and, and something I aspire to as well. It's like sometimes you're looking through, um, you know, somebody's um, filmography and you're like, oh, I, I forgot they shot that because, you know, maybe just because of whatever year you're in, you think of them as having shot these recent projects, but you didn't yeah. realize, oh, they did that weird sci-fi thing over here, or it's like, oh, that's weird, they're doing a horror thing, but no, it makes perfect sense, like, I feel like there mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, I feel like that would, that's the ideal, you know, so it's, it's definitely very um, genre-based, you know, mm -hmm. and so I think that if we, I don't know, if we start, like, looking it up in, like, a specific DP who did this one, you know, jump to this one sci-fi project, and how that was informed by somebody else, but, like, off the top, like, I don't, I don't have. I think it is a lot about um, about yeah the the genre in itself, and you know obviously like what the director's bringing to it, and like if it's a franchise, um, you know sci-fi. There's a lot of different influences there, you know, where you can't really control it. Even you know, like I, you know, stuff like um, like like the Mandalorian. It's it's really it, it's really influenced by concept art and yeah you know, so many other things that is out of your hand but um yeah it's just a genre I don't really like the genre well you know that makes me think about uh there was another dp i interviewed a couple weeks ago and he mentioned how he went on a streak where he did a couple horror films mm -hmm. and it was exciting because he had never really done that genre before uh and so it's kind of interesting to think about how maybe people are more familiar with actors being typecast. And I think uh, that does bleed over into a lot of behind the scenes and behind the, the camera. Yeah. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak about how that's affected you or yeah. if maybe there's something super atypical of you that you'd really like to do someday. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I touched on it a little bit before too when you were asking me about yeah. style and stuff. It's like, yeah, I think that's like a huge fear. Honestly, I, and, and, and it's like more um, pronounced, I think, with like commercial work, you mm -hmm. know, um, you can't like get out of a certain style because, you know, there's so much like money involved, blah, 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 that like you need to hire the TV that shot that exact same thing. Um, but um, but it definitely crosses over into narratives um, with the, the low budget short films. You know, it, it, there's a little bit more wiggle room of trying to get out of it. Like, you know, like I was talking about before, you know, sort of um, trying to, to pivot. A little bit um, and, sh and show that you can do something different um, but um, oh sorry just train of thought in answer to your previous question homecoming the first season of homecoming okay is at uh, um, Amazon's homecoming is, okay yeah. um, it, it is sci-fi it has sci-fi elements and I just love that show so much like aesthetically speaking okay it, it, it has that anachronistic thing going on um, has split screen. It is like it's anamorphic. It's um, the color palette, like every single thing about that show. It's like it's older, you know, the second season's out and everything, but um, I come back to that so much in terms of like, you know, it's like streaming television. Um, it's underrated. It's like <laughs> that's the show that I want to shoot in, in essence, you know. That's cool. It's like great story, everything. 
Those great. I've been, um, I feel like that's like been on my watch list. But you know, I actually you have to watch. To, I'm curious. Uh, do you uh, feel like part of that pivot process for you involves an agent as a cinematographer, or are you in that land of I, I still am curating it all myself? Yeah, I am in the land, right? Because um, I'm sure. Well everybody really talks about it the same way, but like that whole question of getting an agent is, is just like a snake eating its tail. You know, it's like, oh, you can't go look for an agent. Um, agent has to come to you, but then it's like, well, then um, there's only so long you can wait to get a film into Sundance. And then at some point, you know, uh, so like I'm, I'm on the cusp because it, it is true. Like I don't, I, I spend a, a disproportionate amount of time, um, like like looking at uh, like you know, arguing about sorry negotiating about like rates, um, and like contract points, and I don't want to do that. Sometimes a team is okay enough where you can have that separation um, between the director and like the producers who's handling that stuff, where you can get a little bit. Um, you know, less amicable on one side and have it not um, affect your relationship, the, the creative relationship, but it does affect you in that you are only one person. So it's like for that project, I'm spending so much time doing this like non-creative, um, non-constructive stuff that, you know, by the time I turn back to the director, I feel like there's like less of me to give because I can't spend the entire um, you know, time, you can't spend that whole month or whatever, you know, um, on that film because that those short films in themselves are actually, um, you know, taking away time from working on commercial projects that, you know, kind of sustain your lifestyle, you know what I mean? So, yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's, it, it, the, the dream is to have somebody to do those things so that it could just be when I turn my attention to this um, low paying creative project that I love that, I can give it all of my attention and not start to sort of subconsciously resent it. I, th I think that resentment is important actually, because, you know, I want it to be positive and I don't want to have all this background stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so it's like a lot of noise and I would like love um, some of that to be off my plate, honestly. Um, but yeah, but what can you do? It's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very um, like obscured process, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say it's a, it's been very inspiring and humbling to hear where everyone is in their careers in this series so far, uh, and it's wild, you know, because like you you really have to commend yourself for how far you've gotten from where you are. But yeah. it's just nuts to think about all these like next steps. You know, you get through this like big life hurdle in your career, and you're like, oh my god there's so many more, <laughs> but you got to like, you know, pace yourself. I get it. You know, it's one thing when you talk to someone who's in their sixties or seventies, like they can look back and like, oh, I'll look at all these years and I accomplished this, this, and this. But you know, if you talk to them when they were right in it, maybe it'd be a different conversation, but yeah, I think the perspective is, is really important. Yeah. You got to spend energy in, in trying to keep perspective. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of perspective, how are you staying sane during the COVID quarantine? Oh boy, oh boy. Um, well, there's, in one way, you know, educating yourself is great, you know? There's never been a better time. There is almost unfettered access to, <laughs> um, to camera people and gaffers and, and everyone. So there's like all the organized panels and there's a lot of, um, sort of semi-private Zooms that I very much appreciate uh, being a part of. Um, so like, you know, I, I have been talking more regularly and have gotten to better know a lot of people that, you know, would have been people that you just um, either like just saw very quickly at, at like a, at like a networking event. And it's like, well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Like, you know, I'll just talk to you whenever. And now you can be like talking for like an hour, hour and a half um, for real. Um, so that's been very interesting. Um, and then other than that, you know, I know some people have been like not watching things on purpose or, you know, there's like also pressure to watch things that are like, um, like culturally relevant, but then, 
I'm like, you know, actually I've already watched a lot of those on my own time. <laughs> so um, I kind of just watch whatever I want, um, which is nice because it kind of ties into when I was talking about like just watching like television in a sense. Um, like I, I feel because I have more time, I feel less pressured to like, well, I got to go catch up on, you know, I miss these films from like the 2018, like, um, award cycle, like the screeners still looking at me. Um, you know, it's in a sense, it's like, there's less of that. And it's like, you know what? I can watch, um, 911 Lone Star, um, <laughs> because my friend is on it or something like that. And, you know, which is really nice. And then, um, and it kind of like, kind of tangent but going back to before like I love shows like that where um like for example like Shonda Rhyme shows or whatever it's like there's a lot of things in it where like suddenly you're like watching this thing to decompress and then there'll be like um I think there was like one scandal episode where it was like the solid like eight minute um sort of uh conversation slash monologue where they're just talking about like being a black woman in America and I'm like this is amazing it's like, you know, you get to use it because not every single moment it's like, oh, this this got to be some hot HBO, you know, perfectly lit shit that everybody's watching. It's like, well, nobody's watching this space in whatever season for, you know, when, you know, you know, you've worked in television shows, you know, when like a series matures, I love watching the maturation mm. series because the things that you can start doing in the later season, you know, it's like sometimes it's like post peak of a television series is like the best time for certain moments, you know, that you can, you can do stuff. And like, I love watching for moments like that. Like I like watching, you know, like Angela Bassett talking, you know, uh, her character talking with like a girlfriend about whatever. And there's like no pressure for it to be mm -hmm. something in particular. Yeah. And um, it, it's just watching like representations of people, you know, and I love that stuff. Yeah, those little kernels of moments are so nice. Like, I, yeah. I definitely noticed that too during this. Of, uh, I, I oscillate very much between going like, I've never seen this movie. I need to see it now. It's a classic to mm -hmm. just watching something to turn my head off or yeah. watching something purely because I love yeah. it. Yeah, but, but those are the moments where you can find it when it's, it's about subversion is really what it is. You know, it's like there's subversive moments that you can get away with in, in like streaming and television as a format that you can't do when it's like, like this tight, like 86 minute, like um, indie film where like every single moment is like the most precious thing. Yeah. Um, I love that stuff. I do love that stuff, but there's also like these, these other ways um, where it really taps into what I like about making um, like film and stories because it's like, you, I, it's like, I can't believe that that is, available to, to watch and experience and the, totally. this is how we got there you know by like kind of subverting the system yeah that's definitely the, the fun part of actually being able to really savor it you know like I can pause and be like sometimes I watch something with my boyfriend like oh did you see that like we just watched that did you see that and he's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> like I'm watching it right next to you I'm like no but did you see that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> those are fun yeah. um well I know I could talk to you all day but I was wondering if before we wrap up, if um, you wanted to address the elephant, that is, what do you think our industry will look like when we, if we, will we ever go back to work? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think like a lot of people, I, I wish I had answers. I think that's a predominant thing. Um, there is, I think there's a lot of sort of disgruntlement right now in these early phases about how different the job looks and feels, you know, um, like, cause we don't want it to turn into like a tech support job, which I think is what a lot of some of these earlier projects, um, are feeling like, um, I've, I, I've, I've declined a couple of, um, projects. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but, you know, mostly just like not being safe or like the only ways I can think about to make them safer takes away the nature of what we do yeah. um, to the fact where, you, you know, down to it, then you feel like, am, am I like, um, like a, like a technician pushing a 
like literally a technician pushing a button button and like leaving the room because I shouldn't be here. It's like, it's, it, you know, it's so it's coming down to these fundamentals. Mm. I think that it will be like, in, and speaking from somebody who's not union. Um, so I think the translation of, you know, like uh, tens and hundreds of people working together and what those um, shows will look like, obviously I can't speak to it. You know, I can only hear other people's sort of trepidation and, or hopefulness and whatever. Um, but sort of like from my, from the space that I work in, I don't, I don't know. I don't know when it can really pick back up to a meaningful level um, where, you know, so yes, yeah, so just on a personal note, like, I feel like I wish I was more sort of part of the system by now. Like, I feel like it, it hit me in a bad spot because I was scaling my productions up, right? Mm -hmm. In, and we've gotten to a point where I would have to scale up so much more in order to retain some of that collaborativeness of, you know, trying to, you know, really, you know, do something. Um, whereas in so, like, you know, in this non, um, non-union, low budget world, I, I don't know, like, we're just constantly, th the way that we've been able to accomplish anything so far is like literally like throwing your body into it, right? It's like, oh, we only have five minutes to get this shot. Can three people just hold on to this thing in the wind? You know, um, we can't do that. We don't have 30 minutes to rig something safely, build a pulley. There's not that time. There's no, I don't see that there's any way the economics of that can work that out because we were already flying so close to it and making up for it by being all together. Um, so I definitely am not optimistic about it. Um, but on the other hand, things keep evolving and changing that maybe in two weeks, my answer will be different. And that's where I'm most hopeful that like, I think that um, I'm waiting for myself to change my mind. That's a great answer. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think if anything, I relate so much in that sense of in two weeks, it could be a different story. You know, you read one article, how they're trying it out here. They're trying it out there. And you're like, I don't know. I think we're all, I think one of my friends explained it well in the sense of we're kind of planning to go back as if we're going back in phase one, but we're phase like last. So <laughs> we'll see what that the world looks like when we're all in the last phases of this. Yeah. If we, we just ever. have to accept the uncertainty right now. I yeah. think that's that's that work. That's, <laughs> it's a, a hard pill to swallow some days, but <laughs> it's important too. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Um, thank I, you for asking me questions. Yeah, I would obviously have preferred to do this over a coffee in real life or a beer or something, but this is also great. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks again, and I hope you have a great day.